Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over paper one, i.e. the multiple choice questions from the 2022 SQA Higher Physics exam paper. Now, there are 25 questions in this section, and I recommend that you try them yourself before looking at these solutions. So let's get into it. Question one says a ball is thrown vertically upwards and falls back to its starting position. The acceleration time graph represents the motion of the ball. So here you can see firstly that the graph shows a constant negative acceleration down here. It then says which of the following velocity time graphs represents the same motion? Well, if we look back at our graph, we know that the ball is going to be thrown upwards with some non-zero value of velocity, and that the ball will reach zero meters per second at its highest point in motion before it then starts falling back downwards. And the ball will change direction, which is shown by moving from one side of the x-axis to the other on a velocity time graph. So if we look at our options here, if we want to start at some non-zero value of velocity, then we're looking at A, D, and E as our options. And then we said that at its highest point in motion, it's going to reach zero meters per second. Like is shown in A, D, and E, we've got zero meters per second at its highest point in motion. But then in order to show this change in direction, remember we need to go from one side of the x-axis to the other, which is shown in graphs A and D, so we can eliminate E because it's not showing it going below the x-axis there. So it's between A and D here, but you'll see D starts at a negative value of velocity, which doesn't make sense for the acceleration time graph that we were shown. So for the acceleration time graph that we were shown, we had a constant negative acceleration below the x-axis, so that means we're defining downwards as negative here and upwards as positive. So if the ball is thrown upwards to begin with, then it must be this graph here, A, where we've got a positive value of velocity to begin with. So that means our answer is A. Question 2 says a student uses the apparatus shown to determine the acceleration of a trolley as it moves down a ramp. So here's your card on the trolley, it's moving down this ramp and you've got one light gate connected to an electronic timer. It says the trolley is released from rest at point P and moves down the ramp. A card attached to the trolley passes through a light gate at point Q. The time for the card to pass through the light gate is displayed on the electronic timer. The vehicle's acceleration A is determined using the relationship V squared equals U squared plus 2ES. Then says the student makes the following statements about the terms U, S and V. So statement 1 says that u equals 0 meters per second, statement 2 says s equals the length of the card, and statement 3 says v equals distance between p and q divided by the time displayed on the timer. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, let's look through each one and decide which of them are true or false. Well, for u equals 0 meters per second, that is true, because if we look back at the context of the question here, remember the trolley was released from rest, so u must be 0. And for statement 2, s equals the length of the card, well, in this situation, s is equal to the distance between p and q, because if we look back at the picture, p to q is our displacement or our distance travelled. So s here is going to be the distance between p and q, not the length of the card. So we can say statement 2 is false there, and for statement 3, v equals the distance between p and q divided by the time displayed on the timer. Well, this is where we do actually need the width or length of the card in order to find the final speed v of the trolley passing through the timer. So here we can say that v is equal to the length of the card divided by the time displayed on the timer, which means that this last statement is false. So we have statement 1 is the only correct one, which gives us answer A. Question 3 says a spacecraft unloads cargo on the surface of the moon. The gravitational field strength on the moon is 1.6 newtons per kilogram. A package of mass 3.0 kilograms moves down the ramp. So you can see you've got this ramp at an angle of 34 degrees to the horizontal and you've got this mass on the slope. It then says the component of the weight of the package acting parallel to the ramp is. Well remember whenever you've got a mass on a slope, also known as an inclined plane, you can use mg sine theta to find the component of the weight acting parallel or down the slope. So we can say that w parallel in this case is equal to mg sine theta, and plugging in the numbers, we have 3.0 for the mass times 1.6 for the gravitational field strength on the moon, which we're told in the question, times sine of 34, which is the angle to the horizontal. So putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 2.7 newtons, which is option B. Question 4 says two blocks are suspended from a ceiling by ropes as shown. So we've got the ropes here with our two blocks of 12 kilograms and 15 kilograms, and we've got points X and Y there. Then says which row in the table shows the tension in the rope at point X and the tension in the rope at point Y? Well, if we think about X, first of all, the tension at X is given by the weight of both the masses combined. And you can see that in the picture here because both masses are contributing to the tension at X. So let's find the weight of both masses combined. We can do W equals mg, 
which equals the total mass of 12 plus 15 times 9.8 for G on Earth, and put that into your calculator should give you an answer of 264.6 newtons. And if we round that to two significant figures as used in the question, then we have about 260 newtons. So we're looking at options D or E here, and we can discard the rest. And if we think about the tension at Y, we can say that the tension at Y is caused by the weight of the 15 kilogram mass only. And again, if we look at the diagram, we can see it's the 15 kilogram mass only that is causing the tension in this part of the rope. So to find the tension at Y, it's caused by the weight, so we can calculate the weight of the 15 kilogram mass. So we have W equals mg, which equals 15 times 9.8, which equals 147 newtons. Again, to two significant figures as used in the question, we can round this to 150 newtons. So that means my answer here is E. Question 5 says, During an experiment, a student inside a lift stands on a newton balance. The mass of the student is 50.0 kilograms, and the lift accelerates upwards at 1.2 meters per second squared. So there's the student, there's the newton balance, and it's showing you that it's accelerating upwards at 1.2 meters per second squared. The reading on the newton balance is... Well, I'm just going to do a wee sketch here of the lift situation. So here's our lift, here's our upwards force, which is the reaction force, and we've got our downwards force, which is the weight. And I've drawn the reaction force R to be bigger than the weight downwards because we know it's accelerating upwards. So that means there must be an unbalanced force F acting upwards on the lift. Now we can write the unbalanced force F as equal to the bigger force minus the smaller force. So F is equal to R minus W in this case, the reaction force minus the weight. And to find the reading on the Newton balance, remember this is equivalent to the reaction force R. So I want to rearrange this to find R. So I'm going to add W to both sides. So I get R equals F plus W, but we don't know what the unbalanced force or the weight are. So let's put in our expressions for both of those. So we have R is equal to MA from F equals MA plus MG for W equals MG. Now we do know the mass and the acceleration and the gravitational field strength, so we can use all of those values. So this is equal to 50.0 times 1.2 plus 50.0 times 9.8, and if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 550 newtons, which is option D. Question 6 says water flows at a rate of 1.0 times 10 to the 6 kilograms per second over the Victoria Falls. The Victoria Falls are 120 metres high. The total power delivered by the water in falling through 120 metres is... Well, because the water is at a height of 120 metres, it's going to have gravitational potential energy. So let's find what the gravitational potential energy is first, and then we can use that to find the total power delivered. So we have EP equals MGH. Substituting in the numbers, we're going to substitute in the mass per second, the kilograms per second value, and that's 1.0 times 10 to the 6, times 9.8 for the gravitational field strength on Earth, times 120 metres. And putting that into your calculator gives a value of 1.2 times 10 to the 9 joules per second. Now you'll notice I've not just written joules for the energy, I put per second because we were told the mass per second here. So I'm just making sure I include that per second in the units. So we've got 1.2 times 10 to the 9 joules per second. And remember, 1 joule per second is the same as 1 watt, the unit of power. And that means I've actually already found the power value which is 1.2 times 10 to the 9 watts and that's because the units here are equivalent so we can say the answer here is b question 7 says a spacecraft passes the earth at a speed of 0.4 c a light on the spacecraft pulses on and off a passenger on the spacecraft measures the time between the pulses as 2.5 seconds an observer on Earth measures the time between the pulses as... Well, this is a time dilation question, so we need the equation for time dilation. T dash equals T over the square root of 1 minus V over C squared. And we're asked for the time as measured by an observer on the Earth. And since the event is to do with the light pulses, and this is happening on board the spacecraft, that means an observer on the spacecraft is going to measure this proper time T because they are in the frame of reference of the event, whereas the observer on the Earth is not going to be in the frame of reference of the event, so they are going to measure dilated time or relativistic time. So we are trying to find T dash in this case, so let's sub in the numbers to see what T dash is. So we have 2.5 divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.4 C over C squared, now notice that we've got the C's on the top and bottom of the fraction, so we can cancel those out. And then you can do 0.4 squared in your calculator, then 1 minus that answer, and then the square root of that total answer. And then you can do 2.5 divided by that answer, or you can do this fraction as a one in your calculator, but you should get an answer of 2.7 seconds. So that is the answer C here. Question 8 says a student makes the following statements about the expanding universe. Statement 1 says the evidence supporting the existence of dark matter comes from estimations of the mass of galaxies. 
Statement 2, the evidence supporting the existence of dark energy comes from the accelerating rate of expansion of the universe. And Statement 3, the peak wavelength of radiation emitted by hotter stars is longer than that for cooler stars. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, if we start with Statement 1, the evidence supporting the existence of dark matter comes from estimations of the mass of galaxies. Well, that is true because remember dark matter accounts for the unusually high orbital speeds of stars within galaxies, and we can actually estimate the mass of galaxies from the orbital speeds of these stars within the galaxies. So these things are all linked, and it's to do with dark matter. For Statement 2, the evidence supporting the existence of dark energy comes from the accelerating rate of expansion of the universe. Well, that is also true, because remember dark energy is to do with the fact that the universe is expanding, but it's doing so at an accelerating rate. And lastly, Statement 3, the peak wavelength of radiation emitted by hotter stars is longer than that for cooler stars. If we look at our diagram of power output against wavelength for the black body radiation curves, you can see we've got a hot star here and a cooler star. And for the hotter star, you can see the peak wavelength for the hotter star is actually a shorter wavelength than for the cooler star. So that means this last statement is false. So we have 1 and 2 only are correct, which is the answer D. Question 9 says a police car is travelling at a constant speed of 31.0 meters per second towards a stationary observer. The siren on the car emits a sound with a frequency of 820 hertz. The speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. The frequency of the sound heard by the observer is... Well, here we need to use our equation for the Doppler effect, which is FO equals FS times V over V minus VS, where FO remembers the frequency of the sound heard by the observer, and FS is the frequency of the sound source. So we have FO equals FS times V over V minus VS, and you'll notice I've put a negative in the denominator because we're told the car is travelling towards the stationary observer, so we need a negative in the denominator. If the car was travelling away from the stationary observer, we would have a plus sign in the denominator instead. So substituting in the numbers here, we have 820 times 340 divided by 340 minus 31.0, where Vs is our speed of the sound source. So putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 902 Hz, which is option E. Question 10 says a proton enters a region of magnetic field as shown. So you've got the magnetic field pointing from left to right here, and the proton is entering from the top. It says the direction of the force exerted by the magnetic field on the proton as it enters the field is out of the page, into the page, to the left, to the right, or towards the bottom of the page. Well, here we need to use the right-hand rule to see what happens to the proton. So using the right-hand rule, we can say that the index finger, your first finger, points to the right, i.e. in the direction of the magnetic field. Also, your middle finger should be pointing downwards, i.e. in the direction of the proton here. And lastly, if you do that, your thumb should be pointing into the page or screen. However, remember this is a proton, and the right-hand rule only works for negatively charged particles like electrons. So remember, if we use the right-hand rule with a positively charged particle, whatever direction we get for the thumb, we need to flip round or reverse. So if the thumb's pointing into the page or screen, if we flip that, that means our thumb is now going to be pointing out of the page or screen. So we needed to flip it because we were using protons, i.e. positively charged particles, not negatively charged particles. Question 11 says the masses of three particles are shown. So we've got the electron of mass 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. The mass of the proton is 1.673 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And lastly, the Higgs boson with a mass of 2.22 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. It then asks, how many orders of magnitude greater is the mass of a Higgs boson compared to the mass of a proton? Well, remember for orders of magnitude questions, we want to think about powers of 10. We're not really interested in the numbers on the left here, we're more interested in the powers. So using powers of 10 to compare, we want to think about the Higgs boson and the proton. So taking the mass of the Higgs boson in terms of powers, we have 10 to the minus 25 divided by the mass of the proton as a power, which is 10 to the minus 27. So if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 100, which is the same as 10 to the power of 2. So therefore, we can say the mass of a Higgs boson is two orders of magnitude greater than the mass of a proton. So that gives us the answer B. Question 12 says a proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark. A student makes the following statements about protons. Statement 1 is that protons are baryons. Statement 2 is that protons are hadrons. And lastly, statement 3 is that protons are fermions. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, looking at statement 1, first of all, protons are baryons. Remember, protons are made of three quarks, namely two up quarks and one down quark, which means that they are baryons because they consist of three quarks. Remember, mesons only have two quarks in a quark-antiquark pair. So that means we can say that first statement is correct. 
The second statement, protons are hadrons. Well, remember hadrons are composite particles, which means they're made up of other particles. They're not fundamental particles like quarks and leptons. So that means that protons are hadrons because they're made up of quarks. So we can give that a tick as well. And lastly, protons are fermions. Well, remember fermions are just another name for matter particles and protons are matter particles. So we can give that one a tick as well. So that means we have all three statements are correct, which gives the answer E. Question 13 says the following statement represents part of a radioactive decay series. It says that nucleus X undergoes alpha emission to produce nucleus Y. Nucleus Y then undergoes beta emission, and we're asked for what nucleus X is. So we've got X decaying into Y through an alpha decay, and Y decaying into this bismuth nucleus here through a beta decay, and we want to know what nucleus X is. So you'll notice we've got numbers, i.e. the mass number and the atomic number for this bismuth nucleus, and these numbers are at the end. So that means we need to start at the end and work backwards to find what the mass number and atomic number are for Y and for X. Well, going this way, first of all, from Y to here through a beta decay, remember the mass number is unaffected. So the mass number for Y should stay at 214 but it's the atomic number that changes because remember in a beta decay, an electron is fired out of the nucleus, but we also have a neutron within the nucleus converting into a proton. So that means that from here to here, we should be gaining one to the atomic number. So that means we should be going from 82 to 83 here, which means if we're going back the way, we just have 82 here for Y. And lastly, we need to think about the alpha decay. So again, going from X to Y, remember an alpha particle is made up of two protons and two neutrons. So that means we're going to lose four from the mass number because remember the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. So if we lose four from the mass number, we're also going to lose two from the atomic number because we're losing two protons. So working backwards, we need to add four to the mass number and we need to add two to the atomic number. So that should give us 218 there and 84 there. So that means nucleus X will have a mass number of 218 and an atomic number of 84, which gives us the answer C, this polonium nucleus. Question 14 says the following statement represents a nuclear reaction. So we have plutonium-240 decaying into uranium-236 plus a helium nucleus or alpha particle. The total mass of the particles before the reaction is 398.626 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, and the total mass of the particles after the reaction is 398.615 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The energy released in this reaction is... Well, remember to find the energy released in a nuclear reaction, we need to use Einstein's equation E equals mc squared, but that means we need to know what the lost mass is. So let's use the total mass before and after to find that. So we can call the lost mass m, and that's going to be equal to 398.626 times 10 to the minus 27, minus 398.615 times 10 to the minus 27, i.e. the mass before the reaction take away the mass after the reaction. So if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 1.1 times 10 to the power of minus 29 kilograms. So putting that into Einstein's equation E equals mc squared, we have 1.1 times 10 to the minus 29 times the speed of light squared, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. So putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 13 joules, which is the answer D. Question 15 says the irradiance of light instant on a surface from a point source is 20.0 watts per meter squared. The distance between the point source and the surface is 5.0 meters. The point source has now moved to a distance of 25.0 meters from the surface. The irradiance of the light instant on the surface is now. Well, here we need to use our relationship between irradiance and distance from the point source, which is now on the relationship sheet in the exam. So we have I1D1 squared is equal to I2D2 squared, and we're trying to find the new irradiance I2. So let's plug in all the other numbers. So we have the initial irradiance of 20.0 watts per meter squared, that's I1. We then have our initial distance of D1, which is 5.0 meters, and our distance D2 is 25.0 meters. So let's plug those numbers in to get 20.0 times 5.0 squared is equal to I2 times 25.0 squared. So dividing both sides by 25.0 squared there gives us I2 equals 0 0.80 watts per meter squared, which is the answer B. Question 16 says light from a laser is instant on a grating as shown. And it says a series of interference maxima are observed on the screen and they are shown here. It then says a student makes the following statements about the interference pattern observed on the screen. Statement 1 says increasing the distance between the grating and the screen increases the distance between the observed maxima. 
Statement 2 says that increasing the distance between the laser and the grating increases the distance between the observed maxima. And lastly, decreasing the distance between the slits on the grating decreases the distance between the observed maxima. Which of the statements is or are correct? Well, let's look through each one and decide which are true and which are false. Well, if we look at statement 1, first of all, increasing the distance between the grating and the screen increases the distance between the observed maxima. For this, I'm just going to show you a simulation to help you visualise what would actually happen. So here we have a simulation showing you light coming from a laser and it's passing through multiple slits, in this case two slits, and we see the interference fringes produced on a screen at the side here. And in statement 1, it's asking about increasing the distance between the slits and the screen. Well, you can see the distance between the fringes here, but if I increase the distance between the slits and the screen, let's have a look at what happens to the fringes. In this case, they spread out, they get further apart. So if we go back to that first statement, increasing the distance increases the distance between the observed maxima, that is true. For statement two, increasing the distance between the laser and the grating increases the distance between the observed maxima. So if we look back at our simulation here, we want to see what happens when we increase the distance between the source, the laser here, and the slits. So notice how the fringes are spaced just now, but if we increase the distance between the laser and the grating, so you might be able to see that they're now slightly closer together. So that means increasing the distance between the laser and the grating does not increase the distance between the observed maxima, it decreases the distance. So that means we can say false for that one. And lastly, decreasing the distance between the slits on the grating decreases the distance between the observed maxima. Well, looking back at our simulation, we want to see what effect decreasing the slit separation will have on the fringes that we observe. So let's decrease the slit separation a wee bit and see what effect this has on the fringes. So you can see the fringes get bigger and more spaced apart. So that means the distance between the maxima observed is actually going to increase in this case. And we can actually see that as well if we think about the grating equation, d sine theta equals m lambda. If we rearrange this for sine theta by dividing both sides by d, we get sine theta equals m lambda over d. And then we can think about the relationship between sine theta and d. So we can write that sine theta is directly proportional to 1 over d, where d is the distance between the slits, i.e. the slit separation, and theta is measured from the central maximum out to the fringe that you're interested in. So by seeing what happens to sine of theta and therefore the angle theta, that tells us how close the fringe fringes are or how far apart the fringes are. So the bigger the angle theta, the bigger the distance between the maxima, and the smaller the angle theta, the smaller the distance between the maxima. So we can say that decreasing the distance between the slits, decreasing this d value, will increase sine theta and therefore theta, and that means the fringes will be more spread out, i.e. spaced further apart. So that means this last statement is also false. So we have one only is correct, which gives the answer A. Question 17 says which row in the table shows what happens to the speed, frequency and wavelength of red light as it passes from diamond into air? So we've got our columns of speed, frequency and wavelength here and notice how we're going from diamond into air and because diamond has a refractive index of 2.42 we say it's more dense than air which has a refractive index of 1. So that means because we're going from a more dense to a less dense material, the light is going to speed up, so its speed should increase, so it's going to be either D or E here. And remember the wavelength does the same as the speed. So the wavelength needs to increase as well, which is our only two options there. But remember the frequency of light is always going to stay the same. So that means we have no change for the frequency, which gives us the answer D in this case. Question 18 says the output from a signal generator is connected to an oscilloscope. The trace seen on the oscilloscope screen is shown. The Y gain setting on the oscilloscope is 2.0 volts per division, and the time base setting on the oscilloscope is 5 milliseconds per division. And you'll see each of the boxes here represents one division. Which row in the table gives the RMS voltage and the frequency of the output from the signal generator? Well, let's find the RMS voltage first of all, and to do that we first need to find the peak voltage from the oscilloscope trace. So remember peak voltage is all to do with the Y gain setting, and we're looking at the Y axis or the vertical plane on the oscilloscope. And remember the peak voltage is found by doing the Y gain setting multiplied by the number of boxes or divisions for the amplitude of the wave. So here we have three boxes or three divisions for the amplitude, and that's going to be multiplied by the Y gain setting. So we can say that the peak voltage is equal to 3 divisions times 2.0 volts per division. And notice if we multiply these together, the divisions units will cancel out and we're left with volts. So we get 6.0 volts for the peak voltage. We can then put that into our equation relating RMS voltage and peak voltage to find the RMS voltage. 
So we have VRMS equals V peak over root two, which is your relationship from the relationship sheet. And plugging in the numbers, we have 6.0 over root two, and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 4.2 volts. So we're looking at options A and B here, and we can discard the rest. Then to find the frequency, remember we can find the period from the oscilloscope trace and use that in the equation relating frequency and period. So looking back at the oscilloscope trace, remember the period of the wave can be found using the x-axis or the horizontal plane on the oscilloscope trace. And remember the period t is equal to the number of divisions for one complete wave times by the time-based setting. So we have the 5 milliseconds per division multiplied by 5 boxes or 5 divisions for one complete wave. So we have that t is equal to 5 divisions times 5 milliseconds per division. Again, the divisions will cancel out, so we're left with 5 times 5 milliseconds, which is 25 milliseconds. And let's rewrite that in seconds, so we have 25 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. And now we can write down our equation relating the period and frequency of a wave, which is t equals 1 over f. Or just rearranging for the frequency f, we can cross multiply here to get f equals 1 over t. And then we can plug in the period t. So we have 1 over 25 times 10 to the minus 3. And if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 40 hertz. So we have 4.2 volts and 40 hertz, which gives us the answer b. Question 19 says three resistors are connected to a 3.0 volt power supply as shown. The power supply has negligible internal resistance. The power dissipated in the circuit is. Well here you can see we've got terminals of 3 volts and 0 volts. We've then got a 9 ohm resistor in series with this parallel combination. And we want to find the power dissipated or power used up in the circuit. So we want to use the supply voltage of 3 volts and find the total resistance from this circuit in order to calculate the power using P equals V squared over R. So let's first find the total resistance of this combination. So we have two resistors in parallel and we're going to add that to this resistor in series. So let's first find the total resistance of these two resistors. So we can say that 1 over RT is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, which equals 1 over 6.0 plus 1 over 6.0, which equals 2 over 6.0. And remember to get RT on its own, we need to flip both sides. So we get RT equals 6.0 over 2, which is 3.0 ohms. Or a shortcut for doing that, remember, is if you have two or more resistors of the same value, then you can take the value of one of the resistors and divide it by how many resistors there are. So here we could take the 6 ohms and divide it by 2 because there's two resistors, and that gives us the 3 ohms. And that's just a quick way of doing that, but remember it only works when the resistors have resistance values that are the same. So we can then find our total resistance in series, so RT equals R1 plus R2, which equals 9.0 ohms for this resistor, plus the 3.0 ohms for the equivalent resistance there, which equals 12.0 ohms. So I've got my total resistance in the circuit and we know the supply voltage. So let's use P equals V squared over R and sub in the numbers. So we have 3.0 squared divided by 12.0, which gives 9 over 12, which is the same as 0.75 watts. So that gives us the answer C. Question 20 says six resistors, each of resistance 5 ohms, are connected to a 12 volt power supply as shown. It also says the power supply has negligible internal resistance. So here's our 12 volt power supply. We've then got 5 ohm resistors in series with this parallel combination of some more 5 ohm resistors that are in series. And then says which row in the table shows the total circuit resistance and the potential difference across X and Y. Well, just like the question before, let's find the total resistance in the circuit first of all. So let's first find the series combination here of the two 5 ohm resistors, and that's going to be the same on the bottom. And then once we've found that, we can add these two resistors in parallel, and then we can add on the 5 ohm resistors in series either side. So first of all in series, RT equals R1 plus R2 equals 5 plus 5, which gives us 10 ohms for those series combinations. And that's on the upper and lower branches here, so we've got 10 ohms and 10 ohms. And now let's find the parallel combination of those two 10 ohm resistors. So in parallel, we have 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, which equals 1 over 10 plus 1 over 10, which is 2 over 10. And then flipping both sides, remember, gives us 10 over 2, which is 5 ohms. But a quicker way to do that, remember, just like we said in the previous question, was that if you've got two or more resistors of the same value, then you can take the value of one of them, which is 10 ohms, and divide it by how many resistors there are. So if we're thinking about this as one resistor of 10 ohms, and this is one resistor of 10 ohms, the equivalent resistance we call it, then we can take the 10 ohms and divide it by two, which would give us five ohms for this total resistance in parallel. So that's the same as the value we just got there. And now we can add up the resistors in series because we now have an equivalent resistance here of five ohms, five ohms, and five ohms which are all technically in series now. So doing that we have RT equals R1 plus R2 plus R3 which equals 5 plus 5 plus 5 which is 15 ohms. So my total resistance here in the circuit is 15 ohms which gives the answer A or B so we can discard C, D and E.
and now to find the potential difference across x and y. Looking back at the picture, it would be a good idea for us to know the total current in the circuit now that we know the total resistance, and we can use the supply voltage to find what that total current value is. We can then do another V equals IR to find what the voltage across x, y is, assuming we can now think about this total resistance here between x and y as a single 5 ohm resistor. So to find the total current, we can say that Vs, the supply voltage, is equal to ITRT, this is just V equals IR, using the total current, total resistance and technically the total voltage in the circuit which is the supply voltage. So rearranging for the current IT equals VS over RT which gives us 12 divided by 15 using our total resistance there and our supply voltage and if you put that into your calculator you should get an answer of 0.8 amps. And now we can use V equals IR again where we want just the voltage between X and Y and we therefore need the resistance between X and Y which is our 5 ohms. So we can say VXY this time equals IT times RXY, this is just V equals IR using some different subscripts to keep us right. And if you plug in the numbers here, we've got 0.8 for the total current times 5 ohms for that equivalent resistance between X and Y. And that's what we found there from earlier. And then doing 0.8 times 5 gives you 4 volts. So that means my answer is 4 volts here, which means our overall answer is B. Question 21 says a circuit is set up as shown. The resistance of the variable resistor is set to 6.0 ohms. The lost volts due to the internal resistance of the battery is. Well here we've got our EMF of 12 volts, we've also got an internal resistance of 4.0 ohms, and we've got a variable resistor in series with an ammeter. And to find lost volts, we first need to find the total current in the circuit. So let's use E equals V plus IR, which is our equation that we use for problems involving EMF with internal resistances. And what we've done here is include the expression for V, which is V equals IR, so that we can say that this is equal to I big R plus I small R, and then we can factorise and take the current outside the brackets. So we can say this is equal to I times R plus R. And then let's plug in the numbers to find what the current I is. Since we know that the external resistance big R is from the variable resistor, that's 6.0 ohms, and the internal resistance small R is 4.0 ohms. So putting in our numbers, we have 12 volts from the EMF shown here, which equals I times 6.0 plus 4.0. So that's essentially 10I equals 12. So I is going to be equal to 1.2 amps. So that's the total current in the circuit. And now we can use a form of V equals IR to find what the lost volts is. Now notice that I'm going to write this as little V is equal to I times little R, where instead of thinking about the terminal potential difference, which is this big V, we're thinking about lost volts, which we can label little v. And notice we're using the total current in the circuit, but then instead of using big R for V equals IR, we use the small r when we're talking about lost volts. So we have lost volts is equal to the total current times the internal resistance. And if we put in the numbers here, we have 1.2 times 4.0 from here. And putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 4.8 volts. So that is the answer B here. Question 22 says a circuit is set up as shown. The battery has negligible internal resistance. The capacitor is initially uncharged and the switch is now closed. So you'll see we have a 220 microfarad capacitor, a 12 volt power supply, a resistor, and then a voltmeter in parallel with the resistor. It then says when the reading on the voltmeter is 7.0 volts, the charge stored on the capacitor is. Well, to answer this, we first need to find the voltage across the capacitor VC. And we can do that because we know the supply voltage and we know the voltage across the resistor. So looking at the circuit diagram, because these things are in series, when the voltage across the resistor is 7.0 volts and the supply voltage is 12 volts, that means the voltage across my capacitor is going to be 12 minus 7, which gives me 5 volts. Because remember, in a series circuit, the voltage across the components needs to add up to give you the supply voltage. So we have the 7 volts across there, plus the 5 volts across there gives us the 12 volts. So we can write this as Vc, the voltage across the capacitor, equals the supply voltage Vs, minus the voltage across the resistor Vr, which is 12 minus 7, which gives us 5 volts. And now we can calculate the charge Q using the relationship between capacitance, charge, and potential difference. So we have C equals Q over V, where we're writing VC because we need to make sure we're using the voltage across the capacitor. So substituting in our numbers, we have 220 times 10 to the minus 6, just converting from microfarads into farads, is equal to Q divided by 5, that was the 5 volts we just found. And then multiplying both sides by 5 gives us Q on its own, which should give you 1.1 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs, which is the answer C. Question 23 says a circuit is set up as shown. So we've got a switch, a battery, an ammeter, capacitor and resistor in series. And then we've got a voltage VR across the resistor and a voltage VC across the capacitor. It says the capacitor is initially uncharged. 
Switch S is now closed. Which graphs show how the potential difference VR across resistor R, the potential difference VC across capacitor C, and the current I in the circuit vary with time T as the capacitor charges. Well, here's our options, and let's think about the voltage across the capacitor first of all. So remember, during the charging process, the voltage across the capacitor is going to increase from 0 volts up to the maximum voltage, which is equal to the voltage across the supply. So for voltage across the capacitor against time, we should see a graph like this one, where we've got the voltage starting at 0 and increasing up the way and then leveling off. If we think about the current, though, remember, it will start off at a maximum value and then will decrease over time during the charging process. And that's because, remember, electrons are flowing onto the capacitor plates, and as more and more electrons build up on the capacitor plates, the electrons, i.e. the current, is going to find it more and more difficult to flow onto the plates of the capacitor due to the electrostatic repulsion of the electrons themselves. Negative charges want to repel each other, and that means the current needs to start off at a maximum value when the switch is closed, and then decrease to zero over time. So we should see a graph that looks like this for current with a decreasing curve. Now lastly, we need to think about the voltage across the resistor, and if we look back at the circuit diagram, remember we've got these components connected in series. And because the capacitor and the resistor are in series, remember they will take a share of the supply voltage. So as the capacitor charges, the voltage across that is going to increase. And that means that it needs to take more of a share of the supply voltage, so therefore there's less of a share available to the resistor. So the voltage across the resistor will decrease over time during the charging process. So another way of thinking about it is that the voltage across the resistor will do the opposite to the voltage across the capacitor in the circuit. So for voltage across the resistor, we want something that looks like this, where the voltage is going to decrease over time. And thinking about all three of those graphs, where voltage is going to decrease across the resistor over time, increase for the capacitor over time, and the current's going to decrease over time, we can see that in option E here. So we've got voltage going down for the resistor, voltage increasing for the capacitor, and the current decreasing over time. So our answer here is E. Question 24 says which row in the table describes the conduction band and the gap between the conduction band and the valence band in an insulator? Well, in an insulator, remember the conduction band is empty because there's no free electrons to move about and conduct. So we're looking at unfilled for the conduction band, which gives us A or C, and then the gap between the conduction band and valence band, remember, looks like this. So for our insulator, we should have a large band gap between the conduction band and valence band. And that means, remember, that it's very difficult for electrons to be excited from the valence band to the conduction band for conduction to take place. And therefore, the conduction band is unfilled. It's empty. So we should have unfilled and a large gap, which gives us the answer C. Lastly, question 25 is a skills question because it's got an unseen equation or unseen formula here, and it says that astronomers use the following relationship to estimate the mass m of a galaxy. So mass m, we say, is equal to v squared r over g, where v is the orbital speed of a star in the outer regions of the galaxy in meters per second, r is the orbital radius of the star in meters, and g is the universal constant of gravitation which is on your data sheet. A star orbits at a radius of 4.0 times 10 to the 20 meters in the outer regions of the Triangulum Galaxy. The orbital speed of the star is 120 kilometers per second. Based on this information, the mass of the Triangulum Galaxy is. Well, remember with these kind of questions, we just need to write down the equation and plug in the numbers and make sure we're using the correct units. So notice we've got an orbital speed of the star in kilometers per second, but we were told that V is measured in meters per second, so we need to be aware of that when we're plugging the numbers in. So we have m equals v squared r over g, and if we put the numbers in, we get 120 times 10 to the 3, that's converting my 120 kilometers per second into meters per second, and that's squared times r, which is given here, 4.0 times 10 to the 20, divided by g here, which is the constant on the data sheet, so 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And if you put that into your calculator, you should get a mass value of 8.6 times 10 to the 40 kilograms, which is answer E. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.